Oh yeah, just thank you very much. If you are watching this on the recording, you know that it's recorded, but for everybody else, we are recording this meeting so you could watch it again um, later, should you find it that entertaining. Um, but just be advised that if you do ask a question, it will be captured as part of the recording. Um, Petra, would you like to introduce yourself and then maybe I can say a few words and I don't know if Sarah wants to say something, but go ahead. Hi, uh, hi everyone. My name is Petra Williams. I'm one of the humanities and maker teachers for the performance learning program, and I am very happy to be here tonight. I do like a meeting. <laughs> and my name is Brian Hughes, and I am also a teacher librarian at Seacove, also the coordinator for PLP, and occasionally um, teacher. Uh, we also have many of the other teachers um, that teach with us that are in this call and they can they may pop up in the chat box or they may um, choose to grab the mic and speak a little bit later. But we would like to thank you very much for your attention tonight. And Sarah, would you like to say something? And maybe you could even do the official welcome. Oh, thanks, Brian. <laughs> I'd love to do the welcome. Yeah, Hi, welcome. everyone. My name's Sarah Best. I'm the principal here at Seacove. Um, I am home sick today, so please, I'm going to be turning my camera off <laughs> right off pretty, pretty quickly after this. But welcome to all of you. Thank you for those of you who have just joined us. And um, we, I want to thank all of you. I'm, I know we are all here uh, at Seacove and me at home uh, on the traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish people. And we're thankful to be able to come together each day on these lands to learn and uh, work with, with all of, the, of, of your children. So thank you for us, for all of you joining us this evening. And I'll pass it back over to Brian and Petra. Thanks, Sarah. I wish you'd just turn off your camera and go to bed, but that's uh, <laughs> that's unlikely. Um, we are a pretty big group tonight online, which is fantastic, but we are not so big that we cannot make this um, a back and forth discourse, should you wish to engage. So uh, if you can find the chat box in Microsoft Teams, this is a great place to sort of drop some questions. Petra and or I, whoever's not talking, will sort of keep an eye on there and maybe drop um, some answers or bring surface questions for the group. If you'd like to actually talk, then feel free to use the hand button to summon our attention. We'd love to turn the microphone over to you. And if you are watching this on the recording or maybe a question comes up or occurs to you after the fact, feel free to always drop an email. And uh, we're a little bit frantic right now with a few other things going. So I apologize if you have sent me an email. I haven't really had it back right away, but we're trying to uh, stay on top of that. So um, feel free to drop us uh, a question by that way as well. So tonight I would just say that um, most of the information, it's not necessarily there yet, but we are summarizing and posting and trying to keep up to date the parent portal for PLP, which is at parentcentral.ccove.ca. So if that's not already in your favorites or your bookmarks, you may want to add that. Um, and that's where we'll put some of the information that we're sharing tonight once it's written up and shared. It's also the place where you can find um, calendar of events, the project guides to all the learning that's happening in the classrooms right now um and a bunch of other good stuff so um please check that out um at your convenience as well petra you're going to jump in at any point if you want to say anything and here we go okay tonight we said we're going to cover three things so uh we will not be offended at all if uh you know some parts are more interesting to you than others so i know grade eights probably be quite interested in the oregon coast field school at the end but grade 9 10 11 12 maybe not so much so uh you may want to drop off at that point but we are going to start right at the beginning here talking about something we're calling the clr or continuous live reporting this is really um something that's pertinent to all of our learners grades 8 to 12 and it's new but it's really not new but it's kind of new so we wanted that's why we kind of convened the meeting tonight to just sort of um share what this is what some of the intention behind it is and how to maybe understand it uh, if you've already been poking around in Shobi and discovered it you might be wondering what it's all about. So that's really our purpose tonight. Then we'll speak very briefly about the re-registration procedures for next year, and then we'll spend some time at the end discussing um, the upcoming Oregon Coast Field School and answer maybe some early questions that grade eights may have. So here we go. 
Uh, we're gonna jump right in on the continuous live reporting. So this really is built off of this document that hopefully you've seen and read. This is um, Logan, he's a grade 11 student. So uh, with his permission a while back, he said we could share this. So we continue to share it as the example. It is a great example, but we're not necessarily showing it as a specific example of a learning plan, but just of what a learning plan is. Hopefully you have found your child's and you've read it and you've discussed it. This is the real cornerstone or foundation of PLP and their experience as learners. Beginning in September, we had them go through a process where they started thinking about what is my intent as a learner for this school year. They are asked to write this statement of learning intent and then across the core competencies, which are really, again, the foundation of BC's curriculum, they were asked to think about themselves as communicators, as thinkers, and as personal and social relators in these different facets and come up with who were they now and where did they want to be? How could they continue to grow and develop? Then within the context of the courses that are part of PLP, so humanities, maker, um, for grade eight and nine, science, careers, they were asked to think about what are my current strengths in this area? What are my areas for growth? What's the support that I need? And then because if we're being crude, this is school and the currency of school is grades, what do I want to see on that report card at that time when reporting happens that would sort of just be that confirmation that everything I said here about who I wanted to be and that I hope to be coming, what was I going to see that was going to like validate that I was on track, right? Uh, that grade. That is a process that we went through, spent a lot of time on, and every student in PLP has. This is in Shobi, um, and currently most of our students have been through that mid-year presentation of learning, where again, this was a chance to revisit this, measure themselves against where they said they wanted to be at this midpoint in the learning for the year, where are they at, and how is it going? Petra, did I see you wanting to speak? Yeah, I just was going to add that if for some reason you do not have access to your learner show me, please email myself or Brian and we will make sure you get the access code again. Yeah. That is important, so please do that. So you can see on Logan's example here that yellow box where it says extending. And I said that like this was really about leading to that affirmation of performance, the grade. And you might say, well, wait a second, there is no grade on here. I don't see A, B, I don't see 90 percent, I don't see 80 percent. And that is because PLP has sort of been at the forefront of adopting what is known as the provincial proficiency scale. So we have long looked to this, not something that was developed by us, but something that the ministry has been working on, um, was piloting, prototyping, soft uh, introducing, and now for September 2023, this coming September, so next school year, will be the reporting order for the province um, across all of BC, K-9, the use of this, the provincial proficiency scale. So it's um, sort of a different way of expressing learning outside of the traditional letter grades or percentage model. And what it looks at is describing what the students, what the learner's proficiency demonstration is. And you can see that some of our language is mirrored here, right? Extending, proficient, developing, emerging. And then the idea that once learning happens or starts, every learner is somewhere on this continuum working on demonstrating uh, increasing sophistication towards that proficient standing. And in some cases, they extend beyond. So we adopted this language early and now it is coming um, for everybody. It's what we use now though. So this might be something you've seen before. Um, this is sort of like our sort of translation on that previous ministry graphic. You can see the same emerging, developing, proficient, extending across the, um, underneath that arrow. And then above the arrow, just some different words that kind of um, characterize the same idea. And then you see the ministry's language there for the proficiency scale. And what we like to focus on with the learners is like, well, what does work at this level look like, right? So 
Um, maybe I was easier for me as a student and certainly maybe as a parent to say, hey, like, how's my kid doing? Oh, B, A, C, right? It, it's made sense. It's less um, helpful maybe to say, oh, they're developing, they're proficient. What does that really mean? So these descriptors of work is much more uh, useful when we're having conversations with the students about what they've created, when they're looking at our feedback, um, we can say, yeah, this is a complete understanding that you've demonstrated here. It's comprehensive, it's detailed, right? Or, oh uh, yeah, it's a little bit um, more limited, right? You've just gotten started here. This is really simple. I know you're able to like to show a little bit more depth or sophistication, right? So it gives you some descriptions and often we will use this very graphic with students like sort of like a placemat right there on the table as we're discussing their work and so to say hey let's take a look at what you've done here where would you place it on on this scale and in our experience the students are extremely accurate at self-assessing their work especially when they consider it and balance it within this sort of spectrum of evidence so in Shobi, you've probably seen some of this language and some of, oh, I should go back for a second. One thing that is sort of a PLP spin on this is just for convenience sake, as a shorthand, we do use these emojis or the weather icons here to represent these proficiency demonstrations. So um, sort of from the beginning all the way through to the um, extending or the emerging, all the way through to the extending uh, rainbow, and the students know pretty much that they're looking for that sun. The sun is that proficient level. And sometimes they like to see the rainbow, which is they've gone a little bit deeper, a little bit more sophisticated in their work, in their demonstration, and they're at that extending level. So Petrina wants to say something, but you've probably in Shobi seen these icons and maybe now they make a little bit more sense. Go ahead, Petra. I was going to go, can you back one slide? And you're maybe going to cover this. So if I'm stepping on the future, um, you can tell me. But I think sometimes one of the most misunderstood concepts of proficiency assessment and especially proficiency scales is that moving up the scales doesn't mean more. Um, and so if you're making a pie, it's not a more sophisticated pie just because you made two of them. Um, so we really try to emphasize that with the students, but it's really it, that's a very hard concept for all of us to grasp. Um, so I just wanted to pause and emphasize that for a second because I think that's really important to understanding about all assessment and is definitely the root of proficiency assessment as well. And as Brian goes on, I just keep that sort of thought, thought floating through your head. It's not more stuff. It's not prettier stuff. It is those um, terms that the government uses, initial, partial, complete, sophisticated, that really are at the root of the proficiency. And we, I will be exactly um, oh, emphasizing sorry. that later. So <laughs> note, it's good to hold that idea in your head. And I would like to just say now that if you are someone that's listening and your eyes are already rolling back in your head or you're already confused and there's already so much language and big words, then that's totally okay. You should be not um, big words. I think jargon is more accurate. jargony words. Yes. <laughs> jargony yes. words. Jargony <laughs> words. Yes. Multi-syllable words. No. Yeah. Jargon. No. You didn't jargony mean that. words. Um, and that's totally okay. I think that's actually an appropriate reaction. Um, and actually, kind of at the root of what this whole live reporting idea is meant to help students and parents have some security with. So uh, I just wanted to affirm that if you are feeling that way, it's okay, because kind of we might expect you to. Um, but I wanted to like pull up some uh, snapshots here of um, what this looks like in action. So this is one of our grade eight learners, Madeline, uh, and we've taken a peek into her Shobi here. And you can see uh, this is from the finish line project, which means this is the culmination of the learning. This is at the end. It's kind of the end product. And you can see she has a rainbow indicator there, which means in this case, Petra, because Petra was the teacher for this project, has said, hey, you have like achieved or demonstrated that extending level of proficiency with the work you have done in this project. So that rainbow shows up there. What you see in the um, track chat here over time is some of the feedback, some of the some of the comments from teacher, from student. Um, and what's really nice to see is that self reflection from the student there saying what she's proud of, like what she's thought about, what she's noticed in her work, how now that she's reached the end of the project, um, where she's gotten it there. 
Um, Petra, I'll let, since this is your project and your work, I'll let you speak to it in just a second. But I wanted to say that how the student gets to the end here, though, with their sort of examples of this finished work, is really largely based on this direct feedback at competencies. So again, if we're thinking about this as a way we grade or how we arrive. Uh, I find it, of course, it is not easy to do on Teams to find okay, the mute. Okay, uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> it doesn't rise to the top for some reason. Anyway, carry on. Okay, so what, how we arrive at that rainbow proficiency or the extending demonstration is by actually looking at what are the competencies being assessed? What is the actual learning supposed to demonstrate? What are we asking the students to do? And it's not a mystery for them, or it shouldn't be. It should be actually very explicit. They are received these rubrics that actually break out what we're asking them to do. And in this case, I'll go a little zoom in here so you can see one in specific here. You can see in that a accomplished column in the middle there, it's actually now put in the context of this project. So for this project, that proficient demonstration is going to be this. So Petra, do you want to like just parse that a little bit and explain like this is your handwriting here, what you were doing and what was the feedback for uh, Madeline? Yeah, totally. So for our projects, as you know, we are all um, we assess uh, obviously on the proficiencies, but what we're assessing is the competencies. So it isn't um, so much about the content, and that's part of the BC curriculum um, across all subjects, grade eight through 12, K through 12, um, really. It's not about the content, it's about the demonstration of the competencies they use to understand that content that content so in this case um and in in plp we have made sure our competencies are aligned and together so questioning is a competency we use across all the subject areas of uh plp from science through to maker through to pgp to humanities all those and um, that's not some crazy idea. That's actually something the ministry did develop and actually something the CECOF staff has been working with recently as well um, across all of the school. Um, but the interesting thing about this one is that then what happens is we take that and we individually apply it for its own subject area. So in this case, we were looking at how did they question at a grade eight level and specifically in social studies. And you can see on the left hand side of the screen, right, what that looks like in terms of the competency. And then what the rubric does is break it down to the student to say, what does that mean in this project? What did you need to do to get to the final product? Um, so what you're seeing here is my commentary on different assignments. So normally, and um, this is not necessarily a standard throughout PLP, but it's what I'm going to encourage moving forward is that, you know, when I do different pieces of assessment, I tend to change colors. Um, and you don't have to hand handwriting. Um, we can have voice notes. So on some others, you might hear voice note or um, a tech, you know, type text. But in this case, I was handwriting because I was, uh, it was, I can't remember why, but I was, I was handwriting. So the question was, um, the competency was questioning. And for this one, they actually were assessed on questioning with two different keystones. So the first one was, did, did they complete a logical timeline and things for the project keystones and detail their completion with time blocks on their calendar? So it was specific to, hey, you've got this new project. How do you handle that time? And we worked together in class to lay out the schedule. So we put deadlines on their calendar. We attached it to their project management tool that we provide them, that the school provides them in things. We um, made sure they understood what each of those keystones were with explanations in things. And that was the accomplished level. That was the level of like, was it complete? Was it sophisticated? And what you can see in the feedback that I gave Maddie was that she did excellent use of layout of her things and she did a nice use of calendar overall. So it wasn't just a complete use. She'd really thought about how she was laying out the things that was more sophisticated than just what I'd said in class and copied what I did, which would have been complete. But and then she also had gone in. And when I say nice use of calendar, um, what I meant was I know because I remember is that she had added extra dates and she had like put in some of the personal things she needed to do. And that was the extension. That was the, you know, thinking beyond the requirements. A little later in the project, we revisited the competency of 
questioning. And this time it was because they completed purposeful research and we used a tool called craft to make some research notes. And as they went through the Renaissance stuff, they made notes on the material I gave them in class. And then they had the option to do some external resource. Um, I would give them some sources or we discuss some, you know, we, we call them rabbit holes. They could go down on different topics. And in Maddie's case, when I say strong use as a variety of sources, what she handed in in the craft document, it was not just the research links from the textbook pages I gave them or the website I gave them, but she had gone beyond and found a variety of different other sources she was interested in. Um, and then when usually when that section of the competency is complete, so in this case, there were two different demonstrations. It was two different keystones in um, the completion of the project. I then went through and looked at it as a whole and said, OK, so overall here, is Maddie just accomplished? Is she emerging accomplished? Is she extending accomplished? And it's not an equal or, but in this case, it's pretty obvious from the comments I had made. Oh, yeah, she's really nailed this. So at the end, I just said excellent example overall of her questioning in this project. Perfect, thank you. And that again, seems like a lot. Now remember, this is over the duration of a project. This is over many weeks. Um, those rubrics would be used to provide that feedback for the students to understand, oh, I've missed that mark, right? I, I am not at where I want it to be. I've received some feedback. I can pour that back into my project and move it ahead and move it along to where I want to be at that complete proficient demonstration. So this is all a way of saying that we have, and this part is really not changed. This is how PLP has always communicated learning. But what we found is there is always this sort of like process to translate it now into a grade or for the student to feel the security and understanding of like, OK, I've got all that. I know I've learned some things. I know I've got all these competencies that I've done stuff on. I got a rubric that's got circles on it all. I've got feedback. But at the end of the day, right, the report card comes down to like a grade and to either a percent and maybe a much more succinct comment. Um, but I'm, and I'm not sure, right? I don't know how to take all my sons and figure out, well, what's my grade? So we've heard that feedback and it's something as teachers because while, while there still is a re requirement to report, it's something we also have to grapple with. We needed a, a way to, um, collect that information and present it in a in a clear way for us. And we figured, well, while, we should, while we're doing that internally, it's something that we could expose and share with the students and with parents. Hence, why, what we are calling the continuous live report. So in Shobi, starting now with semester two, we have created um, what looked like new Shobi classes. So there is something called the CLR Humanities, C CLR Maker, CLR Science, CLR PGP, whichever the reporting courses are that correspond to a student's report card, there will be um, a category here with the continuous live report. What it shows at any time is what their current standing is in that course. So if the report card was today, this is the grade and the basis of the comment that would appear on that report card. So if this was first week of September or like early in the learning, right, there would not be a grade. We would not have enough evidence yet to be able to make a determination or to say, hey, the student, um, I can look at the student's work and decide where in that spectrum of proficiency what they're demonstrating. Right. So we would see something like an insufficient evidence at that point until that sort of like comes into a little bit of from like um, course focus into a lot more detail, sharp detail. Once we start seeing that detail in those demonstrations, then we can feed back in this system what we think the student is demonstrating. This should be very closely aligned with their learning plan where we started on this whole conversation. So that process at the beginning of the year is like for the student and the teacher and the parent to like say, hey, my intent for this year is to kind of be right here. And our job as teachers then is to like coach and to prod and to affirm that, yes, the work that you are doing is congruent with what your expectation is. The place to check to make sure that you're on track and that there's going to be exactly on the report card what you think should be there is this continuous live report.
So in the grade column there, you're seeing on the screen, you're seeing both the proficiency and the letter grade. So for grade eight and nine, this current school year, right, the letter grade still appears. Um, come September next year, letter grades will not appear. You will only see a proficiency level. For grades 10 and up, 10, 11, 12, this year and next year, you will still see a percentage. So you'll see whatever that emoji represents the proficiency you've demonstrated, and you will see the percentage that uh, represents the demonstration of evidence you have offered. The other thing you see here in the sh in Shobi is the ongoing conversation that has happened between the various teachers involved in all the different projects that your students do and how the work that they're doing has affected their grade. So in this case, this is um uh, I actually we didn't have a chance to talk to the student in advance, so I redacted his name. I hope I didn't reveal it there. So it's redacted to protect the innocent, but it's actually super nice comments. So uh, you can see in this case, Petra left this comment when we posted published the CLR and the student wrote back and said, thank you so much for helping me achieve this. And of course, Petra says, you, you did all the work. Good job. Um, but so this there's not much of a, a conversation history here. That won't be the case going forward, because as we have the conversations with students in classroom conferences, um, in formal settings, even like the M polls or around um, the work that they're completing, this will be a catch all place where that will um, be recorded. So for parents, you can check in here and see what the teachers are saying. You can see what students are saying about their grade performance, the overall demonstration of proficiency. You might sometimes hear an audio comment at a conversation between a teacher and student about maybe some concerns we have or about missing work or like agreements that have been made. So teacher and student might say, hey, you know, we're missing a lot of evidence here. I'm, I'm having a hard time um, being comfortable saying that you're at this complete understanding because there's some gaps, right? And the student will be like, yeah, I'm going to get that done next week. Great. That's going to be captured here. So we'll have a record and a history and more um, transparency into how we're arriving at a grade during uh, the reporting period. And just reiterating again, if you do not have access to Shobi, please contact Brian or Petra. OK, so I'm going to in summary then um, this is not really changed. All we've tried to do is provide a different window into what this looks like. But grading in PLP is based on evidence over time. It's not based on marks on individual assignments. This is why the provincial move to proficiency is really aligned with our own perspective on what we're trying to encourage, which is to incentivize growth as learners. So we're looking at that demonstration over time. It's based on curricular competencies and the learning proficiency offered by the student. Um, ultimately, grades are determined based on the professional judgment of teachers, considering things like the recency of performance. So again, growth over time. It's not an averaging of a bunch of different inputs and like if it was really low at the beginning but really high at the end, we're going to average and give that middle. No, it doesn't work like that at all. We're interested in growth over time and if demonstration of proficiency is best at the end, that's what we would expect because they've developed those skills, built those skills, practiced those skills, and then shown those skills. Um, equally important though is the consistency of performance. So again, it's growth over time. It can't be like a scatter plot of here, then nothing, 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 then here, right? We're looking also for reliability of performance. And these are kind of also areas that we would have in conversation with students. You may have gotten a small feel for that even during the impulse process. This is part of the reflection where they're looking back. Here's where I realized I didn't show that or here's where I missed an opportunity or here's where I'm going to show that opportunity going forward. Um, so a lot of this is based on the students reflecting based on the feedback we give the students. And now with this tool, it's going to be collected all in one place to be um, provide a more full picture for parents and students. Um, I anticipate this question, especially from senior students. I say, OK, great. Um, 
if the accomplished or proficient standard is the expectation for all, but I'd like to be at that extending level. We even hear students sometimes in grade eight and nine saying, I want rainbows, right? So they've taken the icon, changed it to rainbows. We don't think that that's impossible. Is an, extend, uh, is an, in, is an extending grade possible? Absolutely, right? But as Petra said before, this is not about doing harder work, more work, advanced work. But it's about um, a level of complexity, of depth, of showing their understanding. And Petra did a great job when she was talking about Maddie's work, about how it's not about doing something different or more or extra, but about actually really connecting with what the task is and applying it, showing an increasing sophistication depth. And if I can, I don't want to flip back and give people a seizure, but that chart that gives those descriptors of what this work looks like, it's much easier to think not just about it being like the best, because it's extending is not necessarily the best, but it means they've taken their learning and they've gone past what we would expect everybody to do, right? And to that place where they're showing uh, depth, complexity, sophistication. And just to add on to that, because this is a conversation I have often with learners, is that, you know, as we discuss these things as teachers and move forward in them, we learn from them too. And one of the things I'm that we have not done particularly well and can be better at is where those opportunities are to demonstrate that depth of learning. That it's not just about that the students are doing sophisticated work, and they might be, right? They might be doing really interesting and novel things, but sometimes, and especially the, that is a skill to demonstrate that as well. Um, I joke with them at school, that is the, the currency that is you get a better grade, right? In life, that might be, uh, you know, more money at your job or more power related to the position you're in or who knows, right? But I said to them, one of the skills you need to develop is also showcasing that sophistication, that level of understanding. So whether it's I mention a book in passing and then you go home and read it and you're inspired by that, if you never mention it or it never comes up again, it's it's not something I know about, right? So it's also it's up to the teachers to provide those opportunities, but it's also up to the learners to do to demonstrate them. So we're trying to balance that two way street and it's an ongoing process as well. So learners are getting used to finding some suggestions in base camp about ways they can do that or things they can do and that's something as teachers we've been working on as well so even recently some of you may be asked as part of like pgp 10 one of the things was i suggested find someone who's super happy in your life and ask them why because we've been talking about happiness a lot and i said you know it's not write another blog post it's not record another interview but come tell me about it sometime what what did you find out? And that to me is a sophisticated opportunity. And some learners will have time and be able to do that one, and some might have time for another one later on. Okay. So that's really what we wanted to share on this topic. We are going to be writing up a sort of explainer, a backgrounder for this that will be at the Parent Central portal. Um, so it would actually, if you were um, patient enough to listen through this part of the program, it would be really helpful for us to have feedback on if this makes sense, what you're still wondering about, what you're still curious about, and it doesn't have to be right now, uh, but it could be in an email later on, um, so that we can help us refine our communication around this so that it is better understood by the learners, by the by the parents, and of course by the teachers, um, so that we are pulling together in the same direction as members of the learning team. So uh, please, if you don't have access to Shobi, as Petra has said a few times, uh, make sure you're in there. And if you do have access to Shobi, go in there and check out, find the CLRs, they are set up right now for all of your child subjects, and they should have the semester one report card marks in there. So that should be up to date and complete as of tonight. And now going forward through to the end of this semester for the rest of this school year, that's going to be the repository or the home for this ongoing grading conversation. The actual feedback and critique of their work and their projects is still going to live in Shobi with the projects. This is sort of that step back, higher level kind of report card um, conversation. Okay. 
did anything come up in chat and questions, Petra? Okay, so maybe we'll let you marinate on that. And if people have questions at the end, we can spend some time as well. Okay, so conscious of the time, I want to just uh, not drag this out, but we did want to briefly mention re-registration for next school year, especially for our grade eights who are interested in continuing into grade nine. I did have a few come and ask me, well, do I have to do another application? When do I have my, have my video in? And we should have uh, made you feel a little bit more comfortable by telling you no, that the re-registration or the continuing in PLP process is a little bit more streamlined and a little bit more um, less onerous than um, your grade seven to eight transition. So if you are entering grades nine to 12 next year, there's kind of two things that we're gonna ask you to do. One of them you should already have in your hands, which is the school course programming request form for the grade that you are entering. If you are entering grades um, nine, it's this one sheet for the whole school. And there's a column for PLP. So make sure you are indicating that you'd like to continue in PLP. If you are joining or uh, entering grades 10 to 12, they are this year we have two separate programming forms. So the one that if you are continuing in PLP, you're looking for the one that says 10 PLP or 11 PLP or 12 PLP. Um, so complete that form and return it to the school. Uh, that's the school's process. Parallel to that, we will be um, very soon sending to the learners and parents um, advisory of a online registration form. So just to give you a little bit of background, even though it seems like we're really early to be thinking about next school year, the processes um, for the machine here are in full swing. And it's super important for us to have some solid ideas about what PLP will look like for next school year. And that really means like the numbers of students that, would that want to learn with us and want to continue. So we can start thinking about what are the classes that we can ask the school to compose so um, we, we do not have all the levers. In fact, we have very few levers of, of control, but as much information that we have is helpful to think about what is the offering going to be for next year. And around this time as well, we're even thinking ahead to like, maybe what would the field school opportunities be for next year? And that we need to know numbers um, around that and all the other planning things that go into this sort of one year um, horizon. So um, soon, as I said, there'll be an email coming out that has a very simple online registration form. And if you're interested in continuing in PLP, we'd ask you to complete that um, when you receive it. If you are um, have questions about continuing or you're not sure you want to continue or um, maybe you've had those conversations internally in your family already, we would also love to know about that. So the MPOL process, the students I know get super, well, I shouldn't say they get super nervous. Some get a little bit nervous and anxious about it because they think it's actually about them and they have to get up and present. What they secretly don't know is it's really a fantastic opportunity for us as the teachers and as the people who are working to build and design and develop this program to have that um, input from their voice. And, you know, when they're talking about what they are finding struggling, a struggle, uh, when they're saying, what are my opportunities for growth? It helps us think about um, what are the changes that we can make to the program? What can we, what can we build that is missing as far as capacity on our side? Or what should we double down on or go full tilt with that we think is working or meeting a need that we've recognized? So those processes and listening to all those conversations although it does take a lot of our time, is absolutely um, beneficial for us because at this time of year, as I said, we are thinking about next year and how we said the impulses are about the students focusing on improvement for growth and really as practitioners and as teachers, we are always focused as well on how to improve the program. So um, if that's something that you're having those conversations at home, it could be a ripe, ripe opportunity to offer feedback to us. We would encourage you to reach out. You can always email, set up a meeting, put thoughts on, uh, I was about to say on paper, but you could do that, I guess, sir in an email, we'd love to hear um, that feedback because this is the time of year where we are making some retooling or we have the opportunity to retool, change, adjust um, for next year. Um, we just had a question about conflicts in the timetable. Um, so as always, we make no promises about timetabling. Um, we uh, 
as teachers have no control over the timetable. And in fact, at the moment, no one has any control over the mm -hmm. timetable and in general because the um, district is still looking at the data from the recent survey. So at the moment, North Vancouver is still making decisions about whether the school as a whole would be linear or semestered or who knows. Uh, it's a continuous surprise. Uh, so once that dust gets settled, then uh, Ms. Hall will be very, very busy, our vice principal, creating a timetable with uh, Ms. Best as well. And once that all happens, then uh, we will talk about conflicts. Um, and as Brian already sort of outlined, a huge piece of that is the re-registration process as well. Um, so just like when the grade sevens were applying into grade eight, and if you're grade eight, you know this, um, we didn't make any promises about which academies might be affected or those kind of things. It's the same situation within the school. Um, CCOV is a small school and we do our best at every point to accommodate all learning, um, but sometimes there's tough choices to be made. And if that happens and we come down to a tough choice later in the school year, you would be contacted and that conflict would be discussed. Yeah, and that's part of the reason why we need to have as much information as early as possible, because um, the school is very committed to where possible and when possible to try and navigate around some of those roadblocks. So as much information um, as early as possible is very is very helpful. The last thing I'll add here that is if uh, PLP is open to new registrations at all grades every school year. So you may be a current student at Seacove uh, with a friend who is curious about what you're doing. Um, you should invite them to come and join PLP. So all we take new students at every grade level. So for sure, they follow the same intake procedure as you did. If they have questions about the program, tell them to come see me or any of the teachers. Um, and we we would love to uh, invite them to learn more. And for sure, if you know anybody in your world that is in grade seven entering grade eight and um, curious about PLP or coming to Seacob and, and joining the program, uh, we've done a couple of information meetings in person. There is some information they can find online at our website, plp.seacob.ca, and the registration procedure and deadline is um a little bit of time left to go at february 17th so we would encourage um if they have interest to do that okay we um are going to transition now to our last topic for the night which is the oregon coast field school so this is of mo like i said before of most interest to grade eight families so if people did want to drop off at this point feel free to if you want to hang around um in fact i might just pause for a second and see if there are any questions that are related to our first two topics to see if people wanted to get those in and then if not we will um, share a little information here, and then I see we already have a couple questions that we can maybe answer that are related to Oregon. We'll do that in just a second. So I'll just pause for a second and see if anyone want to jump in. <laughs> okay, I don't see people flying to their microphones. So I encourage if you are in the recording and have a question, please drop us an email or come and see us. And we'll move on to our last topic then, which is the Oregon Coast Field School. Uh, Petra, do you want to? We can just pause and people yeah. who want to leave can leave. Sure. Don't, don't feel, if you if you don't need to hear about Oregon, you can um, abandon us now. Um, uh, thank you for joining us and we will talk to you soon. Um, Again, as Brian said, do email us. We are happy to um, converse. Okay, do you wanna go ahead, Brian? Sorry. Sure. Yeah, so why don't you, Petra, start a little bit by just giving a little bit of a high level um, introduction to our oldest, most uh, Second regular. Oldest. Uh, Second oldest, but most regular. Yeah, that's true, actually. Second oldest, most regular, most excellent and maybe even on a on a secret level one of our our favorite um field school experiences that um lord brian i really hope the 9 10s 11 12s are off this sadly there was a uh, worldwide conspiracy <laughs> that precluded us from going for the last few years but we're really excited to be going back so why don't you just sort of give a bro broad brush strokes and then we can maybe share a few more specifics 
Yeah, so the Oregon Coast Field School, like Brian said, as soon as um, many people don't know that originally PLP started in grade nine. So as soon as we added grade eight, that's when we started going to Oregon, believe it or not. So from the very first year, there was PLP eight. We've always gone to Oregon. And normally this field school happens in the fall, which is as close as possible to the comp to the early days of our PLP eight learning team. So it's, as Brian said, worldwide conspiracy couldn't do it. For the last few years, the last group to go to Oregon was the current PLP 11s. Um, so uh, they have very fond memories. So if you know a PLP 11, feel free to ask them. Or a PLP 12, they also went the year before. They were in grade 8. And so they're, they're all well familiar with it. And to be perfectly honest, the trip this year will be almost exactly the same, except it happens to be in May. So we could not do this in the fall. That was not possible with the situation in the world, but it is possible this May, which is pretty exciting. And we should emphasize this field school is only possible because of the will of the Seacove Pack and the bus it runs, which is why the field trip school is running twice for this group, because we have never done it with a double group of learners. The grade 10s did not go. The grade 9s did not go on this trip. This is just for you in PLP 8 this year. Um, that said, the trip is uh, one of our, like Brian said, it's our favorite uh, because it is such an amazing experience. Um, first of all, of course, you get to know your learning team. Of course, you get to do a lot of fun activities along the way and we get to learn a lot, um, but it really is in some ways the most growth we see from learners. It is centered around this idea of questioning, and I was talking about this earlier if you were involved with the PLP 10s um, who are going to Florida. It's really that same competency around questioning the world we live in and investigating it. And this time, we're really excited that Ms. Caddy it will be joining us, the science teacher, um, because there's a lot of science on this trip. Um, we get to work with the Oregon State University at the um, Science Center. We will do some investigations on the beaches and some different things like that. and um, myself as the humanities teacher, we get to do um, a textual investigation of um, some texts that are set in Oregon and apply them and learn about them. And we do all that through the different lenses of this idea of questioning and processing. So it is a really amazing opportunity to do that learning on the road because field schools are school. It's 24 hours a day school um, for everyone involved. Um, that doesn't mean we don't get to have fun, but it's a pretty intense experience and we always come out of it really glad it happened if we didn't we wouldn't do it again but we were we, we brian has willed this into being and we're pretty excited about it yeah and i think um sometimes we, we get we got lots of different questions about like well why oregon it seems far away we could go somewhere closer and there's really a whole myriad of reasons why and um, some of it stems from our experiences in the past and our familiarity with the venues. And over time, um, we this is a trip that we've done. I don't I don't know if you had said like eight times in the past or something like that. We're very familiar with where we go, and it's just the perfect venue for grade eights who are sort of um, need to practice some skills like how to be in a um, sleek sleeping arrangement, aka hotel area where there's lots of other people, and maybe that's a struggle at first but you know when we stay in state parks with yurts they can actually be a little bit more rambunctious it doesn't bother people um and coupled with fantastic learning abilities at a budget that is um within reach usually of most people um actually going closer to home in some ways is often more expensive so we are very um confident that we've put together an amazing experience and as Petra said we usually go in October even November when the weather can be great or it could be quite iffy and believe me we've had both in the past we think this time of year the weather should be spectacular and very nice um, so uh, hopefully you did find in the email a link to what you're seeing on the screen here which is what we call the trip prospectus gives you a little bit more of the background on some of the learning objectives and goals uh, an outline of what the idea 
itinerary will look like. We have some pretty well established partnerships with like the Oregon State University has the Hatfield Marine Research Institute there. It's a little bit like a Bamfield field station for their um, university and they have some fantastic opportunities for us to work in their labs with uh, marine biologists doing citizen science and actually collecting specimens and uh, really fantastic uh, hands on activities, as Petra said, very science based. Um, and also some other partners there. There's a lot of very interesting history, a lot of like war history, a lot of uh, we have very good relationships with some of the local businesses that um, because we've been visiting year after year after year, know us really well and are really welcoming um, and that we can actually connect with on project work. And then we also have some other super fun just activities that really let leverage the amazing natural environment um, of that area. So we're really excited about it because PLP8 is a big group. We are going to go in two waves. So we have the dates. You see them on the screen there. They were sent in the email. We have what we're calling Oregon 1 and Oregon 2. So it's basically a week and then a turnaround and then another week. Um, the itinerary is taking shape, so we will have a more formal pre-trip meeting a little bit closer to the event where we would give you the finalized details of uh, what's happening on a day by day, minute to minute basis. Um, but we have shared with you um, the dates. We have shared with you um, what we think the budgeted cost would be. And in our experience, we're pretty close to delivering on that experience. And we've also asked for the we split the payments into two payments, one now and then one closer to departure. And we require that first payment um, soon as a way of confirming participation. So as you know, we have these two trips. We need to make sure that they are balanced. We, um, we'll be traveling, uh, it is a road trip, so we'll be traveling by Seco bus and a minivan. So we have just enough allocated seats if we split the group into two. Um, for ease and for some functional and um, structural reasons, we did decide to split the group based on the humanities uh, block five, block eight split. And I know there's already a question that that causes a conflict for people who are involved in the cabaret on the evening of May 27th. So that is a conflict that has come to our awareness after some uh, of these dates and arrangements have already been set and made. So we are aware of that and we are having some discussions with um, with the music department and thinking about what options might be available to mitigate that. We're not really able right now to make any promises or even offer what a solution could look like, but it is something we're aware of and um, working on is what I could say. And we will be able to share some information about that um, shortly as to sort of have those conversations here at the school. Um, I would like to encourage people to read this page and then reach out if they have any questions. For sure, we're going to pause. I'm going to stop talking now and we'll be happy to answer any questions you have right now. I didn't want to um, go into too much more detail about the trip, although I'm happy to, um, because that is kind of what will unfold as we get a little bit closer and share at the pre-trip meeting. But I think the broad strokes are outlined here in the document. It is a road trip. We um, stay in yurts which are super fun and nice so it is sort of camping but not really these are fully covered heated with electricity and soft beds um accommodation so it's it's um a nice way to go but you're right in the state park um in a beautiful natural place where you can drift off to sleep and hear the ocean so it could not be um, a better a better situation, one that usually the kids are extremely excited about and works out just great. So as I said, we've done this trip many times. We're excited to go back. Um, I'm going to pause there. Pedro, you can add anything else you'd like to add, and then let's just entertain some questions. And I also would say we will take a few questions on while the recording is going, if people like, and then some people, times people would prefer not to be part of the recording. So I also then we'll stop the recording and we will hang out again and take um questions sort of after the recording as well so i'll just pause there how many people will be in each yurt good question kind of depends um the yurts have space for 
five. <laughs> Will there be random groups? You mean for sleeping? Um, the sleeping arrangements, um, we ask you to tell us your preferences and we reserve the right to arrange them as need be. Um, but we try to make it that at least at some point you will get a chance to be with your bestie. This trip has three different sleeping locations. So um, we will normally PLP tradition is that we sort of shuffle and juggle the um, room arrangements at each different location. So that sort of keeps things fresh. And as Petra said, we always survey people who um, you'd be comfortable with and want to um, be with. And, and then whenever any combination, you usually will have that security. And then in our experience, as these trips go on, you will become more and more comfortable with anybody and enjoy um, getting to know and meeting and spending time with other people as well. So I know you're probably thinking teachers always say that and it's not true, but in our experience, it's kind of true. And uh, I think that's usually how things go. Um, it is not. <laughs> it is not five people in one bed. Um, <laughs> it is. Uh, I think in the you will be in your own sleeping bag. So this is not like a hotel bed where you share linen. It is your own sleeping bag. Um, you will uh, have your own sleeping bag. And I think two, am I right? One of the beds is a double bed, Brian. So it'd be two people on, in their sleeping bags on that one and then individual. Um, there will not be parent chaperones. Um, there will only be teachers. So the three teachers involved are Miss Caddy, Brian Hughes, and myself. That is standard for, um, I think, every field study in PLP and high school. Uh, um, non PLP classes will be informed that you're missing. Um, so you'll miss um, up to five days of classes. Um, they will know that you are missing those classes. For grade eights, that is two other classes, um, one of which is most likely an elective, um, and the other of which would be, uh, depends on what uh, your makeup is. Those teachers are told in advance that you will be attending a field study. They're familiar with our field studies. They know there will not be a great deal of time to be doing loads of homework and you um, don't have loads of homework in grade eight anyway or should not. Um, if you feel that way, you should talk to a teacher. Um, and uh, we would encourage, of course, in advance that you have those conversations with your teachers about the missing classes and when you come home as well. And uh, we've had the benefit the last few years of the tutorial time and taking advantage of that is a great win for that. Um, if you have a conflict with other days, can we switch to the other group, Brian? Uh, so we're, we can't guarantee anything right now, but of course you've already sort of inferred that one of the flexible options we have because there are two dates of two sets of dates is that there might be some flexibility on that. So what I'd encourage you, Sydney, is to um, reach out to me or any of the teachers and just let us know, um, or your parents can email me what's up. And then of course we consider um, the requests, but uh, we, we're not really sure yet how that's gonna work or what that's gonna look like. Cause as I sort of alluded to before with the cabaret conflict, there's a few other things that are in the mix. And then um, ultimately, we are constrained by making sure that the two date sets must have essentially equal number of people because of uh, we will be counting right down to the number of seats on the bus. Um, so um, oh, all go ahead. our trips, uh, I just wanted to add because it's normally something we say at the pre-trip meeting, but I just want to be super clear that PLP trips are not something that Brian goes to a catalog and hires someone to plan and do. This is something that is done by the teachers off the side of our desk in our very small amount of spare time and done because we feel the learning is so relevant and the potential of growth on these trips is so important for these learners that we're willing to do that. So what that means is there is not a clear cut situation where, um, you know, like it, it, that there's a, that the, 
what am I trying to say, Brian? Help me out. I don't know. I'm waiting to hear what you're going to say. <laughs> so uh, what I was saying, and especially in situations like this, it's not like you're paying um, an air flight that you can then just contact and get a refund on, right? It is. It involves the bus, the, the pack is purchased and the gas we pay and the hotels we that we'd stay in, right? So all of those costs, it's not a clear cut situation where if there is a cancellation, you get 80% of the refund back or something like that. So Brian can answer about the illness, but I just wanted to make it clear that this trip, especially for Oregon, is a labor of love on behalf of the teachers who are organizing it. So it's nothing is as as a clear cut yes no and this is what the package says go yeah. ahead Brian. The, the oregon trip is a little bit um unique in that regard because unlike say if you joined earlier you heard us talking about the great tens are about to go to florida trips like that that have airline um tickets or advanced costs that we had to like pay to secure programs or accommodation things like that there's like sunk costs any money like that was protected by travel insurance. So if a student is sick or unable to go for um, a reason or any reason, they have that insurance to um, fall back on. In this particular trip, if the student was to become sick, you know, um, just before we departed or knows they wouldn't be able to participate for a reason, uh, we don't we have a little bit more flexibility because we don't have to commit in advance as much spending as we would maybe for a different kind of trip. So in this case, um, there probably there aren't there would not need to be travel insurance purchased because there's nothing to insure. Right. There are no plane tickets. There are no there's no advanced spending for food and things like that that is spent as we go or as the students consume it. There are some fixed sunk costs that the trip has to bear and share. So things like teacher replacement or um, cost of the year. Yeah, things like that. So, you know, if uh, the budget has a contingency, so if a student, you know, is not unable to go because of illness, it doesn't impact everybody else in a, in a material way. It's, it's fine. And we're able to provide a refund um, in that regard. And based on the situation and, and what we can manage to do, the amount of that refund would be commiserate with the cost paid in advance. To be clear, if you read the small print in the informed consent, the school district's official language is that they are not under any obligation to refund any amounts um, for any reason, actually. But that is just sort of standard legal language. In practice, um, we, of course, try to be as reasonable as possible, and um, that's sort of our general operating um, attitude. So, as I said, like, we, of course, consider the circumstances and the and the situations and then try and be as possible, um, as generous as possible and as accommodating as possible. Um, and I would point yeah. out that Brian works very hard, and the reason these costs is as, as high as the cost may seem he works incredibly hard to make those costs workable to all learners. So he would literally be checking every two days. Can he book the rental van at a lower rate? Uh, can he, you know, talk to a restaurant to get a, a group rate for students? Uh, he will work, um, yeah, very hard to make that happen. Great question here about crossing the border. Um, so, uh, and actually another parent did email uh earlier asking about like renewing passports and things like that. We do encourage students to have a passport, um, a valid passport for travel that if they and if they do have that, we'll, they will bring that um, just to uh, let you know, our standard procedure is the students do not hold their passports. We hold those in custody for them um, during the trip. Um, but a little known fact is actually for school travel by land, a passport is not required. Um, you can travel if you are a Canadian citizen, I should add. If you are a Canadian citizen, you can travel with a birth certificate. Um, you cannot as a family, but under the official umbrella of a school on a school trip, you can travel with a birth certificate. So if you do not have a passport or are not able to get one in time, although I was speaking with a different parent on a totally different trip and they were saying the passport office is now much more accommodating and has suddenly been told they can get a passport much faster than just recently. So we would encourage people to um, have a passport 
and to um, have that with them on the trip. But if that is a barrier to participate, as long as they are a Canadian citizen with a birth certificate, we have um, experience and we have taken students um, frequently um, with that exemption. Someone's asking about a Nexus card instead of a passport. Um, I think that's probably also okay. Although actually, if you read the small print mm, on take, Nexus, no, I take the passport. Yes, yeah, so if you read the small print on Nexus, they tell you that you are um, supposed to always travel with your passport as well. Um, so we would encourage um, the passport. So in advance of the Oregon trip, we will have our standard pre-trip meeting, um, which will cover a lot of like the other questions about packing and these forms and all of that, and that information will come out. Um, so if you missed a chance to ask any of these questions, we just wanted to provide an opportunity to clear the air and uh, be super clear about why we do this trip. I am going to turn the recording off now. So if you are watching on the recording, thank you for your time and attention. If you have any outstanding questions or questions that weren't answered, please reach out to us via email. We'll do our best to get back to you with an answer. Thank you and good night.